With the U.S. Air Force's growing influence post-World War II and the development of the atomic bomb, the U.S. Navy began to seek its own strategic nuclear force and pursued seaplanes that could not only conquer the sea, but also land and air. This ambitious goal and bitter rivalry led the Navy to partner with aerospace manufacturers to prototype at least four different seaplane models, including the only one to ever break the sound barrier. Among them were orders with the Glenn L. Martin Company to design the P-6M Seamaster, and with Convair to create the F-2Y1 Sea Dart, the XFY-1 Pogo, and the 3RY Tradewind. These experimental seaplanes promised to change naval and aviation history, conquering the world with their sea-based flexibility and ability to launch and stay below detection by most conventional radar systems. It was thought that the program would render the aircraft carrier obsolete. The Seaplane Striking Force When the Pentagon chose the Air Force B-36 long-range bomber over the Navy's ambitious nuclear-armed supercarrier, the USS United States, the Navy decided it needed an unconventional response to maintain its relevance. If the Pentagon would not fund any new aircraft carriers as part of a nuclear deterrent, the Navy decided its nuclear weapons planning would forego them altogether. Instead, it would build a fleet of seaplanes to be called the Seaplane Striking Force, or SSF. In 1948, the Navy opened up a contest for a supersonic fighter seaplane that could reach long distances without the need for a dedicated base or carrier ship. The Seaplane Striking Force would be made up of long-range strategic bombers powered by jet engines, as well as the additional reconnaissance and support aircraft. As for desire for the aircraft to be seaplanes, the decision was driven by the Navy's problems with successfully landing the latest heavy supersonic jet plane models on its existing carriers. The SSF needed to be able to take off and land from and on water. It would only approach ships and submarines for supplies, maintenance, and fuel. The Glenn L. Martin Company submitted their concept for the P-6M Seamaster flying boat for the 1948 contest. Convair initially submitted a proposal for the F-2Y-1 Sea Dart, but it also ended up proposing the turboprop-powered XFY-1 Pogo and the R-3Y Tradewind as well. The XFY Pogo The Pogo was the least promising of Convair's proposals. It was designed for vertical takeoff and to land on a small ashore platform or boat. It had a tail sitter to stand vertically, small landing wheels at the ends of the wings, and vertical stabilizers. The aircraft had three fatal flaws that marked the end of its run just after the prototype phase. First, vertical takeoffs and landings were unfamiliar to pilots, especially since they were used to seeing the landing area while performing a landing. Looking at the sky and rearview mirrors offered as a solution turned out to be overly challenging. Additionally, the plane's massive turboprop, made of two Allison T-38 engines with two three-blade propellers, required a total horsepower output of 5,500. The manufacturer struggled to produce a reliable engine that could power the rotor for a vertical liftoff. Finally, the Pogo was far too slow in comparison to the MiG Soviet jet fighters, only reaching around 550 miles per hour, which could not be easily slowed down due to a lack of air brakes and spoilers. The aircraft had around 80 test flights, but was cancelled as a program in 1955. Only one prototype survives in the National Air and Space Museum in Maryland. The XF-2Y Sea Dart Convair's main proposal for the 1948 contest was a turbojet delta wing plane with a waterproof hull that could take off from the sea on two retractable hydro skis. Convair was given a contract in 1951 for two prototypes of the craft to be named the F-2Y Sea Dart. When resting on the water, the plane floated on its hull with the edge of its wings touching the water. The first prototype had skis that were extended once it reached 10 miles per hour at takeoff. The second had a single ski, which actually performed better than the two skis in testing. The aircraft flew for the first time at San Diego Bay in 1953. It accidentally and briefly lifted off in January during an intended taxi run, and then was flown officially in April. Due to manufacturing limitations, the plane's engine seriously underperformed, while the ski system made the plane violently vibrate at takeoff and landing. Already facing the threat of cancellation, the Sea Dart was doomed on November 4, 1954, when Convair test pilot Charles E. Richburg, a Navy veteran of the Second World War, lost the aircraft at San Diego Bay. Reports state that he forced the engines beyond their limits to reach supersonic speed. The Sea Dart disintegrated in flight. The incident pushed the Navy to dismiss the Sea Dart as an experimental project. More service tests were carried out, but its production was ultimately cancelled. The R-3Y Tradewind 
A third Convair proposal that actually entered limited production integrated many technologies used in the Sea Dart, but with a more conventional turboprop design. Two types of the flying boats were ordered in May of 1946, one for passengers and the other for cargo. The craft was named the R3Y Tradewind, and it was given improved engines, soundproofing for the cabin, and air conditioning. It could carry 25 tons, or 103 people. Five R3Y1s were built to transport troops and fuel. Six additional ones were built with a lifting nose and high cockpit, with the name R3Y2 intended for heavy transport. It was supposed to work as a flying LST, or landing craft, but it turned out to be challenging, bordering on impossible to keep the R3Y2 steady while aircraft were loaded or unloaded. The majority of these models were then turned into tankers so they could refuel in flight, using the probe and drogue method. This was actually carried out, and the aircraft set a record speed, aided by high-altitude jet stream winds, when it flew at 403 miles per hour in 1954 during a transcontinental flight, which no seaplane had done before. It could also fuel a then-record four fighters at once. Unfortunately, due to engine unreliability, only 13 models were ever produced. The Martin P6M Seamaster Out of all the seaplane proposals received, the Navy believed the Glenn L. Martin Company's submission to be the most promising. Named the P6M Seamaster, the first prototype, XP6M1, flew on July 14, 1955. It had four Allison J71A4 turbojets near the wing roots on top of the fuselage. That feature of the early design was later changed as the engines were too close to the fuselage. Secret testing on Chesapeake Bay revealed that the afterburners could potentially melt the plane's body. A redesigned prototype was launched in November of 1955 with some initial success, but it was lost on December 7th after the control system failed mid-flight. After more tests, the T-tail and flight control instruments were modified in order to prevent fatal accidents, and ejection seats were added. The new ejection seats were put to use only six months after installation, when the Seamaster prototype began vibrating violently during a test. The four-person crew flew down in parachutes as the airplane disintegrated in the air. Testing of the improved Seamaster continued, with practice bombing, mine laying, navigation, and reconnaissance flights. Twenty-four aircraft of the P-6Ms were ordered, and the first of them was delivered to the Navy at the beginning of 1959. The production model utilized Pratt & Whitney J-75 P-2 turbojets, more powerful engines with no afterburners that could push the seaplane up to 650 miles per hour. At low altitude, the Seamaster could reach Mach 0.9, faster than the new B-52 being used by the Air Force, offering the Navy the tantalizing possibility of gaining the upper hand in the delivery of America's nuclear arsenal. Plans called for the Seamaster to be equipped with either two Mark 11 30 kiloton nuclear bombs or one B-28 thermonuclear bomb with an explosive yield of one megaton. The plane was promising and impressive, but it was not free of complications. When going upwards of Mach 0.8, the aircraft would suffer from intense buffeting. There were also issues when landing the plane on the water, where engine surges were common as the top floats dug into the water and threatened to flip the plane. The problems were serious enough that the aircraft was excluded from the naval fleet until solutions were found. The lofty goals of the nuclear seaplane project, however, would be abandoned before the Seamaster could be perfected. The development of ballistic missile submarine technology accomplished what the seaplane project could not, bringing the Navy squarely back into America's nuclear deterrent equation and eliminating the need for an atomic seaplane striking force. It was thought that the Seamaster could continue as a mine layer, but the program was far too expensive and could not satisfy any long-term strategic objective. The original production order of 24 was reduced to 18 and then to just 8 Seamasters. When the Navy canceled the project in August of 1959, after having spent a whopping $400 million, equivalent to $2.5 billion in 2004, the Glenall Martin Company tried to sell the aircraft to airlines as a civilian eight-engine plane named the Sea Mistress. The endeavor was so unsuccessful that the company cut aircraft design and production out of its activities, shifting focus to missiles and military electronics. The leftover Seamasters were scrapped for parts. The Ballistic Missiles Age With the efficiency and lower cost of the ballistic missile submarine and the improvement of aircraft carriers, the Navy lost interest in seaplanes. Neither Convair nor the Glenn L. Martin Company had succeeded in presenting something so revolutionary that made the high price tags worth it. Within the Navy, senior carrier aviators outranked and outweighed those who supported seaplanes during the 1950s. Furthermore, 
ballistic missiles meant that nuclear attacks could be delivered unmanned, reducing risks. The seaplanes that were intended to conquer the world failed, and the idea for a seaplane striking force was abandoned. <laughs>